<laughs> but thank you all for caring enough to come out here and uh, listen to this topic on the recent Irish vote and is it really the death of Catholic Ireland. Uh, the topic uh, tonight is a very painful one for me and so it's fitting that we're doing this uh, in Lent. It's very personal and painful. Uh, like many of you, my childhood was filled with uh, all sorts of stories, historical recollections, how great it was to be an Irish Catholic. I mean, I was raised in a family that was like the greatest thing you could be, unless, of course, you were Italian. But, uh, <laughs> but I remember as a young schoolboy traveling with my brothers and sisters on a public bus to go to St. Felicitas and Perpetua Church uh, in Southern California, and there was this great big plump Irishman named Fines Morrison, who found out our last name was O'Donnell. I was on the bus with my, my brothers and my sisters. And so once he found out we were Irish, he was from Ireland, he kept bringing us books. And so we got all of these books on Ireland, the history of Ireland and things like that. And uh, we just became immersed in Ireland, her people, her folklore, her history, and her traditions. What really got me going sort of academically was actually in the fourth grade. I was at St. Leo's School up in... Uh, this was in San Jose, California. And one of my classmates in fourth grade, his name was Walter Boys. I still remember this guy. He said, hey, O'Donnell, there's a book in the library about one of your ancestors. I said, oh, really? I should go look that out. And of course, it was Red Hugh, Prince of Donegal. It was the Robert Riley book that came out that was the inspiration for the Disney feature film, The Fighting Prince of Donegal. Some of you might have seen that. But I read that book, and that began my love affair uh, with Irish history, which is like walking through a minefield. But anyway. <laughs> But in the turbulent social chaos of the 1960s that I grew up in, that history deepened my love for the Catholic faith and for everything Irish. And for me, the Catholic faith and being Irish was something that was inseparable. They always went together. Uh, the history and culture so deeply intertwined with the Catholic faith that was brought by St. Patrick was truly a glorious tradition. Uh, the monastic life, the missionary outreach that characterized Ireland in the golden period from about the 5th to the 9th century, truly incredible. Uh, missionaries going out to the lands that one day would form Christendom after the collapse of the Roman Empire, like Finbar, St. Enda, St. Ciaran, St. Columkill, St. Columbanus, St. Gaul, all of these who would have been known to any medieval historian. Uh, St. Aidan, women like St. Bridget, St. Ida, who were just phenomenal influences on the church. There were so many saints sharing those common names from the 5th to the 9th century that Ireland became known as the Insula Sanctorum et Doctorum, the island of saints and scholars. There was a veritable deluge of saints, people who fell in love with Jesus Christ and fell in love with the church. Now after that, there were battles with pagan Vikings, of course, the triumph of Brian Baru at Clontarf, which was part of the great victory for Christian civilization in the West, victory for Christendom. You had the violence of the Norman invasion in 1179. Then years of persecution following the Heritian Revolution and the Protestant Revolt, characterized by an effort to transform the nation into John Bull's other, Ireland, other island. Now, I'm a nationalist. I should let you know right away that that's where I kind of land on the political spectrum there. It was a time of armed conflict and defense of the faith. And as a result, a Catholic nation and people emerged without a state. They had no state. The people were basically disenfranchised. That period was followed by penal laws, by mass rocks, hedge schools, the great hunger, not the famine, but the great hunger, and through it all, priests and people remain united, faithful to the divine faith that was brought to them by St. Patrick. In 1916, a blow was struck for Irish independence, and there was a bold proclamation of a republic that would cherish, and I use these words right from the proclamation, cherish all the children of the nation equally. That uprising led to a war of independence, the establishment of an Irish free state, which really celebrated its freedom and its Catholic identity with a great Eucharistic Congress in 1932 that was attended by Gilbert Chesterton and many, many other people from around the world. And eventually, Ireland at long last was proclaimed a republic and given a constitution in 1937. And I'd like to read the preamble for you because it gives context for what we're gonna be talking about tonight. This is how the constitution opens. 
in the name of the Most Holy Trinity, from whom is all authority, and to whom, as our final end, all actions, both of men and states, must be referred, we, the people of Eri, humbly acknowledge all our obligations to our divine Lord, Jesus Christ, who sustained our fathers through centuries of trial, gratefully remembering their heroic and unremitting struggle to regain full independence of our nation, and seeking to promote the common good with due observance to prudence, justice, and charity, so that the dignity and freedom of the individual may be assured, true social order attained, the unity of our country restored, and concord established with other nations to hereby adopt, enact, and give ourselves this Constitution. Isn't that beautiful? That's the preamble. It's still there. It's still there. Eamon de Valera, who was the primary author of that Constitution and went on to become President of the Republic, wrote, and I quote, In this day, if Ireland is faithful to her mission, and please God, she will be, if, as of old, she recalls men to forgotten truths, if she places before them ideals of justice, of order, of freedom rightly used, of Christian brotherhood, then indeed she can do the world a service as great as that which she rendered in the time of Columkill and Columbanus, because the need of our time is no whit less. And he concludes, you sometimes hear Ireland charged with a narrow and intolerant nationalism, but Ireland today has no dearer hope than this, that true to her holiest traditions, she should humbly serve the truth and help by truth to save the world. She was a gem in the crown of Christendom. She had a unique role to play in the life of nations in the world with that type of sentiment and that type of constitution. And that's important to reflect upon. I first visited Ireland in 1973 and experienced the Ireland of my dreams as a concrete lived reality in 1973. All the stories and everything that I'd heard, I found a living, vibrant faith there in 1973. I hitchhiked all over the country and one of the best guys I met was a Protestant farmer in County Cavan named Harold Strong. Picked me up, put me in his mom's bedroom because she was gone and fed me, I, you know, traditional Irish breakfast, took me everywhere, I want to go to Trim Castle, took me there and finally said, you're too kind, I got to get back on the road and start hitching. But a real affection, he even drove me to Sunday Mass. Now that took a lot, because <laughs> took a lot. Because when he picked me, he dropped me off, he says, oh, it's disgusting. You know, but I said, <laughs> but he still took me there. And I thought this is a great ecumenical moment in the history of Ireland. But uh, I journeyed up to Donegal, visit Glencombe Kill, Father McDwyer's beautiful uh, effort to try to help the people in that area. And I remember hitching up with a Father Saunders with 10 students from Dublin, young men, and uh, he took us up to a mass rock way up in the far north of the country and just having mass at a mass rock. Uh, and I remember at the consecration kneeling in the mud as the sacred host was raised for us to adore. And I think that mass, tears was running down my cheeks at that moment, and I said, that mass is more beautiful than anything I've been at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. I mean, it just the sense of heritage, the sense of tradition, what it cost our forefathers, men and women to really suffer for the faith was really manifested in that remote glen where we celebrated mass that day. But now we have to telescope up to May 25th, 2018, a day which the United Nations had ironically declared Missing Child Day. Do you know that? That's the day the vote happened. The United Nations called it Missing Child Day. Our pilgrim group, we were there when this vote took place. We had visited Crowpatrick, we had celebrated mass at the shrine at Knock, and then we pulled into Dublin. And we went into Dublin, it seemed like every single light post in that city had a repeal sign on it, had a vote yes for repealing the pro-life amendment. Now the Eighth Amendment simply said this, this is how the amendment read, that was voted in back in 1983. The state acknowledges the right to life of the unborn child and with due regard to the equal right to life of the mother guarantees in its laws to respect and as far as practicable by its laws to defend and vindicate that right. Beautiful. In the Constitution. Voted there by plebiscite. Many of the repeal signs that wanted us, remember that this is the irony, they were very smart. If you voted yes, you're repealing the amendment. 
So it forced immediately the pro-lifers to say, no, vote no, which gives a negative message. Psychologically, it becomes very, very difficult. But many of the repeal signs spoke of compassion, women's health, trust women, signs saying, vote yes for your daughter. One that really struck me, vote yes for your grandchildren. Very strange. Now, to be fair to Dublin, the yes posters were all over the country. 30 years ago, it would be impossible to imagine that taking place in Ireland. But they were out in broad daylight advocating for abortion and for a yes vote. There were also no posters to save the eighth, urging voters to love both. Heartbeat at 18 days. Too extreme. Posters that said, most abortions in England are performed on healthy babies. And then harking back to the spirit of the 1916 proclamation, cherish all the children of the nation. And there were a lot of images of children in the womb, which clearly pointed out their humanity. We arrived in Dublin that Friday afternoon. We went to Comanum Jail, and we paused briefly outside the cell where Michael Mullen, who had defended Stephen's Green in the 1916, where he was incarcerated, where he said farewell uh, to his wife and children. And I read his last letter. And last letter, it was hard to get through without tears. His last letter, he said, please, you must remember, Ireland must always remember that she is Catholic, and that's why we're doing this. Okay, one of their patriot founders at the 1916. And he said that, and then went to confession to a Capuchin friar and prepared for his death by firing squad. We ended our visit to going to the exact spot where all of those men were shot, those famous men who rose up uh, at that time. And our guide was so moved, he joined us in prayer. We all stopped and did prayer. As soon as we left Kilmainham Jail, though, there was giddiness all outside the jail. People everywhere were talking, were laughing, and rumor began to spread that the exit polls indicated that there was a shocking yes vote, a landslide for the yes vote to repeal the Eighth Amendment. Most people thought it was going to be very close and probably was not going to pass. Jubilant people, mostly young, gathered spontaneously in Dublin Castle fitting place. For eight centuries, that was the center of English power in Ireland. And a wild celebration began of cheering, screaming, crying, hugging. Saturday morning, we traveled through a jubilant crowd to get to Trinity College. Young women everywhere were shouting, we made history, we made history with joy and exultation. On Grafton Street, walking down Grafton Street, downtown Dublin, I saw about 30 young people, all dressed in black, wearing white masks, holding up signs saying, Veritas. I said, great. These, the, these people must be pro-life. A counter-demonstration is already starting against the vote. And I went up, and that's when I saw the large sign, what they were protesting. They said, go vegan. Go vegan. <laughs> Don't eat animals, but we can kill babies. That's what we're dealing with. At 5 o'clock, we went to Blessed John Henry Newman's Chapel to celebrate Vigil Mass for Trinity Sunday. And in the meantime, all the celebration going on in Dublin continues on. The Irish Times, in its last editorial, the last one they wrote before the election, had this to say, and I quote, The Eighth Amendment describes a world which never existed, a place of moral absolutism, religious certainty, good and evil, black and white, and locks us into that illusion in perpetuity. To remove it is merely to reflect the world we live in. As the last editorial, the snakes were back and the snakes were hissing. I was reminded of the Hebrews getting up to practice revelry with the golden calf. I mean, it was very disordered. You think of the French Revolution where they go and they storm the Bastille, which contained all of those prisoners from the horrible French king. There was one prisoner in the Bastille. Do you know that? He was actually an Irishman. He was crazy. He was locked up because he was mentally unbalanced. That's the one guy who was liberated when they stormed the Bastille. All right. But uh, the glee and jubilation, however, were deeply disturbing to many people, including a number of people who had voted yes, because they said, why are we celebrating? This is something that's very dark and in many is a tragedy. The Irish prime minister Leo Varadkar, who three years earlier ran on a pro-life ticket, that said he was staunchly pro-life, 
urged the electorate the, same, the day before the election to end the centuries of shame. End the centuries of shame. As he dropped his ballot in the box, he grinned and said, all the lads at the gym are voting yes. And he dropped his yes ballot. When the final tally came in, 66.4% had voted yes for repeal, 336 had voted no. Interestingly enough, 40% of those eligible to vote did not even vote, which means the vote itself was 42.5% of the electorate. That's just an important thing to reflect upon. But jubilant women were seen all over Dublin wearing stickers saying, we made history, all around Trinity College, all around Gaffin Street, Dublin Castle. Prime Minister Varadkar proclaimed, quote, what we have seen today is a culmination of a quiet revolution that has been taking place in Ireland for the past 10 or 20 years. In the wake of this horrific vote, he arrogantly sought to reassure the 723,000 plus people who voted no. He said, we are not a divided country. I would like to reassure you that Ireland is still the same country today as it was before, just a little more tolerant open and respectful." Unquote. The most shocking quote from the Prime Minister, he went on to say, today I believe we have voted for the next generation. Today I believe we have voted for the next generation. We have voted to look reality in the eye and we did not blink." End quote. Brendan O'Connor in the Sunday Independent Jubilee wrote a headline, we are all now the liberal elite. Everyone in the country, we're all part of the liberal elite. And I thought to myself, what is so liberal about removing protection for unborn children? Why does that make you liberal? Owen O'Malley opined concerning the vote, and this was his headline, today we discovered Ireland's past really is a foreign country. We have nothing to do with the past. Now, I'll just give you, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. I'll give you just a couple pictures. Hopefully this will work. Okay, here is some of the celebration that's inside Dublin Castle. You can see vote for repeal, everyone cheering, celebrating, spontaneous, and continues its transformation away from Catholicism. Here's the head of the Sunday Times. Ireland opens door to abortion. Hales, quiet revolution, Al activists celebrate majority to repeal the eighth, wearing hearts, just like you too did on their website when they came out to vote yes, encouraging everyone to do that. Here we go, the power of women. This was the cartoon in the Sunday paper, the rosarectomy, mission accomplished, obstruction removed. Get your rosary off the ovaries, all right? Women of Ireland. We're all the liberal elite, enough. Okay, it gets too depressing. I'm gonna try to end on a positive note. I'm not here to depress you, but, I, but in a certain sense, you need to know the reality of what is being experienced over there. What happened, how on earth did we get to this situation? Well, St. John Paul II, during his historic visit to Ireland back in 1979, prophetically in front of 300,000 people, gave a phenomenal homily. I'm just going to quote a part of it because that's part of the context and understanding what happened. Lay people today, he said, are called to a strong Christian commitment to permeate society with the leaven of the gospel. For Ireland is at a point of decision in her history. The Irish people have to choose today their way forward. Will it be the transformation of all strata of humanity into a new creation, or the way that many nations have gone, giving excessive importance to economic growth and material possessions while neglecting the things of the spirit, the way of substituting a new ethic of temporal enjoyment for the law of God, the way of a false freedom? Ireland must choose. You, the present generation of Irish people, must decide. Your choice must be clear and your decision firm. Let the voice of your forefathers who suffered so much to maintain their faith in Christ and thus to preserve Ireland's soul resound today in your ears through the voice of the Pope when he repeats the words of Christ. 
What will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and forfeits his life? What would it profit Ireland to go the easy way of the world and suffer the loss of her own soul? Your country, he said, seems in a sense to be living again the temptations of Christ. Ireland is being asked to prefer the kingdoms of the world and their splendor to the kingdom of God. What a victory the tempter would gain. What a blow he would inflict on the body of Christ in the world if he could seduce Irish men and women away from Christ. And he concluded his homily. Now is the time of testing for Ireland. This generation is once more a generation of decision. When the vote all came in on what many pro-lifers in Ireland now call Bloody Friday, it was revealed that 84%, 84% of the 18 to 25 year olds in the country had voted for abortion. Virtually every one of them went to Catholic schools, grammar schools and high schools. Every one of them. Houston, we have a problem. All four provinces had voted for abortion and repeal. Of the 26 counties, 25 counties, all 25 voted for abortion. There was only one exception. That was Donegal. Donegal. And then they had a, an editor in the paper, Donegal, a, a, a county of farmers and fishermen. You know, backward, unthinking, et cetera, et cetera. When the prime minister, he held the ensuing celebration in Dublin, he tweeted, fantastic crowds, a quiet revolution, a great act of democracy. How did this happen? The repeal side ran a campaign which claimed that the Eighth Amendment had done all of these things. First, it has caused women to die. Secondly, that pro-life amendment to the Constitution caused rape victims to suffer. It caused women with terminally ill babies to be denied health care. It caused the death of Savita Halapanavra, who was pregnant, but she died of a sepsis blood infection. It was a medical blunder. It had nothing to do with the Eighth, but they blamed the Eighth Amendment on her death. In addition, every major media outlet was pro-abortion, every single one without exception. All political parties, every single one, favored the repeal and was pro-abortion, every one. The Prime Minister, who is a practicing homosexual, favored repeal. The Minister of Health, Simon Harris, favored repeal. And the Minister of Children, who is a practicing open lesbian, she also favored repeal. Everyone in the government, with a few exceptions in the Senate, the Doyle, in addition, foreign money was poured in. But the horrible catechetics in Catholic schools, the deep failure of Episcopal leadership in the country, and intense anger at the Catholic Church. All of this created this perfect storm. With the internet and modern communication, Ireland is one of the most internet savvy and computer savvy countries in all of Europe. They're very, very connected. That's why pornography has become an enormous problem in Ireland as well. But the young people in Ireland have more in common culturally with their peers in the EU, in Canada, and in America, and England, than they do with their parents and their grandparents. More time is spent on the internet, and tweeting and texting, than in having conversation in the home. The Catholic Church, which since her liberation in Ireland in 1829, had done so much for the people of Ireland in terms of fighting disease, in terms of fighting hunger, in bearing, taking care of people, helping with immigration and keeping families connected together, including support for the newly established Irish Free State in the midst of the nation's extreme poverty where the church provided a lot of the social welfare in a very difficult time. All of that was forgotten and the sins of her children became the focus of a hostile media that really wanted to take down the faith. The record in the of the church in the current cultural climate in Ireland could not be objectively examined because of why? Clerical abuse scandals that were on the paper all the time. The Magdalen laundries, which were not given a fair balanced treatment, I believe. The allegations of the mother-based home and tomb where 800 uh, babies of unwed mothers were supposedly allegedly buried without any type of ceremony the attack on the Christian Brothers schools, the industrial training schools that they had so that some of the poor children were not treated properly, a horrific adoption children for children from unwed mothers. All of this was put before the public and hurt deeply the church's image as an institution. 
There were other high publicized trials up in Belfast uh, that seemed to downplay the dignity of women. All of this came together. In addition, it was estimated that every year, at least for the last 10 years, 3,500 Irish women went every year to get an abortion in England. So if you do the math, 3,500, that adds up, all right? It's estimated that close to 2,000 in Ireland received illegal abortifacient drugs to terminate their pregnancies at home without any government interference. So that's over 5,000 every year. And so that has its effect. For all of these reasons, communicated in the press, the people were told to trust women. But again, what was the real issue here? We were being asked to trust women who wished to kill their babies. That's what the question really was all about. And we're rightly horrified whenever children are abused in any way, when women are treated disrespectfully, if babies might have been interred without a decent burial, without a proper funeral. Women with difficult pregnancies and tough situations deserve to be loved. They deserve to be supported, of course. But are we so horrified at all of this that we'll decide now just to let their mother kill them? Is that really the answer we're talking about? Is Ireland a different country now? The answer for me undoubtedly is yes, it is. John Waters, a columnist who lives in Ireland, has said it's the most anti-Catholic country in the world right now. Certainly the most anti-Catholic country in Europe in terms of the press and the government. So since the vote, some of the things that have happened, the law that actually was enacted says that all doctors have to perform abortions or they must refer their patients to doctors or places that will do abortions. There is no conscience protective clause at all. When a group of doctors, close to 500 doctors, were told this in Dublin, they rose up in mass and walked out. All right, so there's a lot of tension. There's a lot of pushback and a lot of difficulty right now. Flush with the victory, the Irish government then is now changing birth certificates. They will no longer on the birth certificate list mother and father. It will simply say parent, out of sensitivity to civil unions that are now adopting and getting children, or et cetera. Pro-lifers in the national media and press are now being demonized. Anyone who takes a pro-life position now is a hater, all right, and someone who is an opponent of women's health, and that's the mantra beaten over and over and over again. I firmly believe that this Irish vote, the Catholic Ireland voted to bring in abortion, emboldened New York Governor Cuomo to legalize abortion up to the point of birth, there's no doubt. And then the jubilation, the ceremony that you saw in New York in the State Senate, it was just a reflection of what happened in Ireland. And then they lit up the, you know, the Empire State Building. And now the new Freedom Tower was all lit up to celebrate this great thing. And of course, at the base of the Freedom Tower, there's a plaque commemorating all of the victims of 9-11. And on the names of the plaque, there were 11 women who died in that, 11 whom were pregnant. And so they are mentioned with their unborn children. I mean, the irony is just overwhelming. Remember right after 9-11 when Planned Parenthood put a huge ad in the New York Times, right after 9-11 saying anyone who's a difficult situation will give them a free abortion because of this. There was such a public outcry because of after all of that death, you're gonna be advocating free death. But that's what we're dealing with. And of course, this moral depravity was echoed in Virginia by our own governor who defended the practice of infanticide. Unthinkable, unthinkable. Now back in Ireland, we have a new government commission report that just came out that has recommended the removal of all religious symbols from Irish hospitals. No crucifixes, no statues of Mary. You can have maybe a chapel, but the door has to be closed. It's incredible where we're moving. You know, Aristotle, the great philosopher, once said something very, very interesting. He says, tolerance and apathy are the last virtues of a dying society. Tolerance and apathy, the last virtues of a dying society. The vote in Ireland has now established that no human being has a natural, God-given right to life. The state has the power to give it, and the state has the power to take it away. 
The Irish political establishment will now determine what legal limits, if any, will be placed on killing an unborn child. It's totally up to the government to decide. Choice has become the summum bonum, even more important than a child's life now in Ireland. One of the deepest of human relational bonds is the bond between a mother and her child, which now can be disregarded. Children, young girls and boys, we're going to see this change and they'll be taught that the most important human relationship is not that significant because now a mother is a woman who can choose to love and welcome her child or kill it. And for a nation steeped in Catholic tradition, this is shocking. For men, the gift of fatherhood with its responsibilities to protect their child has no legal standing whatsoever in law. A man has no role or responsibility in this decision, so the family will clearly be weakened and social chaos is going to grow in Ireland. And of course, lastly, God's fundamental commandment, the fifth one, thou shalt not kill, has been abrogated by this law. So where do we go from here? I don't believe this vote is necessarily the death of Catholic Ireland, but it certainly points to a wholesale collapse of the Catholic culture and tradition in Ireland. There is an effort right now to bury the past, to forget the past, don't talk about the past. But truth, of course, is everlasting. And we know that resurrections do happen. Generations of heroic, faithful witness to the faith cannot be banished or forgotten by a simple vote if we're willing to fight and to push back. From Ireland's noble past, people can and must draw strength and vitality, as Pope Benedict stated in his letter to the Catholics of Ireland. We have some copies of that back. I think we brought at least 20. Feel free to take one. If you get it at the table, you can go to the Vatican website and download it if you wish. It's a great read heartfelt response to the crisis from Pope Benedict. Any country that's not going to look back to its history and traditions is not going to have a future and certainly will not look forward to its own posterity. And that's a problem. John Paul used to always say, any nation that ignores its past has no future. That's one of the principal dangers of this vote, this desire to forget the past. The demonic was certainly a key part of this drama. When helpless children who depend on their parents and society for protection are left defenseless in the name of compassion, health, women's rights, equality, tolerance, progress, then clearly these words have lost all of their meaning. He who was a liar and a murderer from the beginning was certainly present in all of this. I remember engaging under a statue of St. Patrick in County Mayo, some of the yes people, and I was just trying to just have a conversation. And they wouldn't allow me to say anything. They just had to rattle it off. And after they finished their whole appeal about women's rights and women's health, they said, but everything you're saying has nothing to do at all with the fundamental reality that you're going to legalize the killing of a child. Killing of a child is not women's health and then screaming in your face and just pointing at me, cursing and using every word in the book. It's less offensive with an Irish accent, but, 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 they, but they were using every word in the book, but this type of thing. Prominent Catholic family that I know very well, very much involved in trying to defend the pro-life amendment, defend the eighth, when the vote came in, received an avalanche of hateful emails. One of them said, since you're so much in love with unborn children, we're going to come at night, we're going to graffiti your entire home in fetal blood. When you hear something like that, you know the evil ones at work. When evils such as contraception, divorce, same-sex marriage are welcomed into a country, death is knocking at the door, and he's not going to stop as a soul. Oh, we will never go for abortion, never go, but you've let all these things bit by bit by bit. And then eventually he's going to say, oh no, I'm coming in, I'm coming in. And he's going to bring seven more with him when he comes into that house. At the recent world meeting of families, one of the most symbolic moments, revealing the state of the church in Ireland, Rita Connolly, I don't know if you know her, she's a beautiful Irish singer. And at Crow Park they were having the entertainment for Pope Francis, and she got up and she started singing Patrick's Lorica, Christ be with me, Christ be for me and there wasn't a single image of Christ. Behind her on the giant screen as she's singing the Lorica, there were giraffes, rhinoceroses, hippopotamuses, 
and then it went up into outer space and you saw a nebula. Christ was nowhere to be found or to be seen. That was, to me, very symbolic of the state. Certainly, Yeats celebrated poem, The Second Coming, cited by many after the vote. We could reflect on what Yeats saw prophetically. What did he say? Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. That's Yeats' poem, The Second Coming. Now, we've seen the horror of child sacrifice before in the golden fields of Palestine, when the Hebrew people first entered Palestine. The worship of Moloch, the worship of Baal, all involved child sacrifice. On the plains of North Africa and Carthage, and down through the centuries, this hatred of childhood and its innocence is something that we've seen. But this is not a time to be silent. This is not a time to be quiet. It's a time to speak out. When the international abortion industry begins to set up its clinics in Ireland, there's already one hospital, I think it's <laughs> Our Lady of Mercy, uh, sets up a clinic. I'm not sure about that, but I think that's what I heard. The horror is going to spread. And what's going to happen? More women will be wounded, children will be killed, and the nation will come to know good and evil in a new way. Pro-life leader John McGurk tweeted after the vote when he got a deluge of emails just all saying you, because he was pro-life, he responded, the problem is the Eighth Amendment was never what was making you angry in the first place. It's not the schools or the hospitals or the ban on euthanasia either. No, social reform is going to make you people happy. You're looking in the wrong place. It was never the journey that was lonely. It was never the country that was cruel. It was never the church that was oppressing you. The, mo the movement you are in won't leave you fulfilled and happy. It will just leave you all angry in company. And he talks about the, how they're going to continue to press to take other things out of the Constitution. But in the end, he said, the problem is that all of those victories are empty of meaning, even this one. Having an abortion in County Louth will not be more fun than having one in London it remains an abortion. You're not free. You're just miserable, probably in greater numbers, closer to home, end quote. Now, I know this is dark, and I'm not here to depress you, but I think we have to clearly grasp reality. Ireland is in free fall. It is in serious trouble. We need to pray for the country. We need to pray for the Episcopal leadership there. But we have to be grounded in reality in terms of what's really going on now. We have to have an awakened pro-life opposition, and there are many pro-lifers now who have not stopped, who are battling nobly. They're trying to go to the press. They're going, doing everything they can on social media to continue to fight, to try to restrict abortion. Uh, they're beginning the whole process of prayer vigils outside places where abortions are starting now in Ireland, but now they're trying to have safety zones where they're not letting anyone get within you know, 300 yards of a clinic. You, see, you can't even protest. I mean, there's major battle going on in Ireland right now. But there needs to be a deep reform of the church. Seminaries need to be reformed in that country. Maynooth needs to be reformed. Catechetics, new evangelization with a pro-life lady, with faithful, zealous priests and bishops working together in fidelity to Jesus Christ and his church. That is the only way to go forward. Because this temptation is so, so horrific. John Paul, just before he left Ireland, this is 79, he had final words for the young people of that country, because you know how much John Paul loved the young. This is what he said. Yes, dear young people, do not close your eyes to the moral sickness that stalks your society today, and from which your youth alone will not protect you. How many young people have already warped their consciences and have substituted the true joy of life with drugs, sex, alcohol, vandalism, and the empty pursuit of mere material possessions. Something else is needed, something you will only find in Jesus Christ. His final words in 1979. This kind of evil will only be cast out with prayer and fasting. And if for all there to be a renewal in society, there's to be a deep renewal in the church. And that means what? Authentic holiness with a passion for truth and zeal for souls. I recall there was a famous passage in Acts of the Apostles where St. Paul 
was going into a pagan swamp city called Corinth, a seafaring town, and he was really hesitating about whether he should even proclaim the gospel in the swamp that was Corinth at that time. And then our Lord appeared to him that night and said, Do not fear, but speak out. Do not keep silent. There are, I am with thee, and I have many in this city who are my friends. And what Jesus said to St. Paul certainly can be said in Ireland today. 736,000 Irish people voted pro-life. That's a great chunk of the population, and you can do a lot with that type of number. The Catholic Church has certainly lost influence, but the and the recent vote has left a deep wound in the Irish psyche. Ireland, that was always a great, great champion of humanity and human discourse and friendliness and courtesy and graciousness and all those things that characterize them, Irish society. But true freedom, like true compassion, can never be divorced from the true and the good. And today there are still thousands of faithful Catholics in Ireland. We need to pray for their courage. We need to pray for their fortitude because everything right now is stacked against them. But a new generation can rise from the ashes because we need a gut check. We need to see reality clearly and what is going on. And if they look to their glorious past, they will be able to move forward and build a wonderful new future, trusting in our Lord who said, Fear not, for I have overcome the world. Thank you very much for listening to me.